Hi. Do you hear me in the back? Excellent. Welcome to Försvarspolitisk Arena and the seminar The Future of NATO and the Transatlantic Link. My name is Katarina Tratsch and I'm the director of Stockholm Free World Forum, or Frivärd, as our name is in Swedish. Uh, today uh, we are hosting this seminar because it's just a few days until the NATO summit taking place in Warsaw. So there's a huge need to discuss issues of European security, but also of transatlantic security. And for this purpose, I have two very distinguished experts with me. Uh, one is Edward Lucas, who is senior editor of The Economist, a writer, and also a senior vice president of the think tank SIPA in Washington, DC. The other one is Magnus Nordenman, who is uh, director of the Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council, also situated in Washington, DC. Uh, the setup for today is that we will hear these two experts speak for a bit. First Edward, then Magnus. Then we'll have a discussion between the two of them before I open up the floor for you in the audience. So please, welcome Edward. Well, thanks very much indeed, Katrina, and thank you for inviting me. And I know we, um, Brexit is all in everyone's minds. We are going to talk about Brexit a bit later on, but I thought, if you'll allow me, I'll just apologise for Brexit right now, and then we get on to discussing it um, a bit later on. I, I would say that it hasn't happened yet. There's an American uh, saying that the opera isn't over till the fat lady sings, and we don't know who the lady's going to be, whether or not she's going to be fat, how she gets onto the stage, what song she's going to sing, how she starts and how she finishes. So there's many possible turnings in the road away in the t road to disaster, but we'll get onto that later on. Uh, I think the first thing to point out is that the transatlantic link and NATO are not synonymous, and a Swedish audience certainly doesn't need to be reminded of that in any detail. Um, but we have all sorts of, we have countries in NATO that have quite bad relationships with America, and we have countries that are not in NATO which have very good relationships with America. So I just want to get that up front. But I think the really big point as we approach the NATO summit in Warsaw is that NATO is really back in business and back in its old business as a territorial defense alliance. And that's actually a huge change. If we'd been having this discussion 10 years ago in 2006, we would have had a NATO which would have expanded to bring in Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and the other former um, countries in the Soviet Empire. But that was a NATO which had no forces in those countries, which was actively encouraging those countries not to do territorial defense, but to get ready for expeditionary warfare and be involved in expeditionary warfare in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever. Um, a NATO which had no plans for the defense of those countries, not even the most basic reinforcement plans, had no threat assessment. The MC-161, the NATO military committee that looks at threats, was explicitly instructed not to think of any military threat from Russia, because Russia was a partner, Russia was part of the NATO-Russia Council, um, and the whole settlement of post-1991 Europe was predicated on the idea that we were never going to be in a military confrontation with Russia, and therefore it didn't make any sense to see Russia as a military threat. And of course, because we had no forces in the region and we had no um, threat, threat uh, assessment and we had no plans, we also didn't have any exercises. And um, we had very limited, um, very inoffensive exercises on things like mine sweeping and, um, and on improving coordination and so on. But that was um, all part of this very benign and I would say quite delusional picture. And what was so interesting was that the countries concerned could see that this was wrong. And Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and Poland particularly were warning NATO, just as they'd been warning all the Western countries and had done actually since the early 1990s, watch out. Watch out. We know Russia very well. We see what's happening inside Russia. and We see the way that Russia is treating its neighbours. And we don't like it. And it may be tomorrow or next year or the year after, but sooner or later, this is going to be um, your problem in the way that it's already our problem. 
And that's really changed now. I think the big change was, first of all, the cyber attack on Estonia in 2007, closely followed by the war in Georgia in 2008, and then the ZAPAD exercises in 2009, um, in which the so Russian armed forces practiced the invasion and occupation of the Baltic states, and there was also a nuclear weapons drill in which the putative target was Warsaw. And that really woke NATO up, and it's taken a long time. Um, I give Obama huge credit for this. He turned up to the Strasbourg summit of NATO in 2009 and said, this is crazy. He was a new president then. He said, this is crazy. We have contingency plans to defend Norway. We have contingency plans to defend Turkey, which doesn't even more have a border with Russia, but we don't have contingency plans to defend the only countries that are actually likely to be attacked, which is the Baltic states and Poland. So the plans were drawn up, Eagle Guardian, they were originally reinforcement plans, basically involving Poland putting the best part of its armed forces in the Baltic states while they await reinforcement from the rest of NATO. That was quite good from a Baltic point of view, a bit less good from a Polish point of view. Um, and those have now evolved into much more developed uh, reinforcement plans. And the NATO summit this week in Warsaw is going to sign off on battalions being based in the Baltic states, American forces um, in Poland, um, new plans and a much more sharp-edged um, approach to, to Russia generally. And that's all great, and I'm really glad it's happening, but it, we must always bear in mind this is a necessary, but it is not a sufficient condition. I think NATO is a little bit in the position of someone who has a hammer and sees every problem as a nail. And Russia is quite capable of causing difficulties in ways that NATO finds it difficult to react to. Uh, I would mention economic warfare. NATO can't do very much um, in terms of guaranteeing energy supplies um, or helping countries that are affected by sanctions. On propaganda, very big part of Russia's um, arsenal, NATO has a STRATCOM center in, uh, in Riga. It's beginning to... Re revive its strategic communications, but NATO can't really do very much about deciding whether RT is a big threat or not. What, what are we looking at doing, looking at the Russian messaging, say, in Poland or in Lithuania or these other countries where it's um, very effective and powerful and, and destabilizing? NATO can't do very much about the use of organized crime. NATO can't do very much about psychological warfare. So in this whole wide spectrum of what we now call hybrid warfare, which Russia is so good at and which we've seen deployed to such effect in Ukraine, NATO's only part of the answer. It's also, I think, worth pointing out that NATO still is handicapped by its consensual decision-making. The really big worry is that something ambiguous happens in the Baltic states or possibly in Poland, and it's takes NATO too long to make up its mind. And by the time NATO has made its mind up, there is a fait accompli on the ground. Maybe something very small, maybe something quite ambiguous, hard to work out. But by the time the North Atlantic Council has met, the facts are on the ground, and it's a case of whether we want to go to war to try and reverse that decision. And I think this is why NATO is thinking very hard now about political preauthorization, things that the Supreme Allied Commander Europe can do really quickly before the North Atlantic Council meets, and also what is sometimes called the coalition of the speedy. The coalition of the speedy is countries which are willing to deploy really, really quickly on their own. Chief among those, the United States, but also my country, Norway, the Netherlands, maybe Germany, maybe even Sweden. It doesn't have to be NATO countries. But as soon as you see something happening which the intelligence says is alarming, you get a few thousand troops really quickly on the ground to show to the Russians, we know what you're up to, and if this gets messy, you'll not just be fighting the Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and a few NATO troops that are based there, you're fighting a much bigger um, coalition. So I think that will be very important. But I think fundamentally NATO is still in real trouble. And the biggest problem is that America is carrying too much of the load. And it is unsustainable that NATO using, um, is continues to use American borrowed money. Why should America, with all the problems it, it, it has, both military problems as with China and so on, um, and with terrorism and all the other threats they have, but also their creaking infrastructure and all the things they need to spend money on at home, why are they borrowing money to defend European countries which say we're really, really scared of, of Russia, but we're not quite scared enough of Russia to spend 2% of our GDP on defense. Now, the big symptom of that is Donald Trump. 
It's one of the reasons why Donald Trump is doing well is because when he says America has been taken for granted by its allies, that resonates, and it resonates justly. Now, we can say to the Americans, actually, you really need to be a European security power. You benefit from this. You need the Europeans to be strong and free and on your side. So there's actually quite a good argument for staying involved, but not to that extent, not to the extent that America supplies 73% of, Ameri of, of NATO's defense spending. So I think we've got a plan on the basis of the worst. We've got a plan on the basis that America is going to continue to disengage from Europe. We've got to plan on the basis that Britain, which is the most important military power in Europe, is going to be very distracted over the next few years with Brexit that we'll come on to. And we've got to think, how do we do defence in other ways? We have to broaden out from just the military side, but also to financial and cyber and information and all the other ways that Russia attacks us. But the good news is we can do that. I wrote a report um, a, few, a couple of years ago called The Coming Storm about Nordic Baltic and Polish security. And I did something um, very simple, which was to add up the GDP of what I called the NBP9, Nordic, Baltic, Polish 9. Those nine countries have a bigger GDP than Russia. Do the math. It comes to about 1.8 trillion for the Nordic, Baltic, Polish 9, about 1.7 trillion for Russia. You have a bigger GDP than Russia, and your defense spending, very crudely calculated, came to nearly 40 billion, and Russia's is 80 billion. Now, you could argue this means you don't spend enough on defense. I'd put it the other way around. I would say that Russia has to look at all sorts of security threats. They have to worry about the Chinese and the Arctic and everything. You only have to really worry about defending yourself. So if we're losing, and I think we are losing at the moment, Russia is on the front foot, we're on the back foot, we don't really have an answer to a lot of things that Russia's doing. That's not happening because we're weak. That's happening because we're weak-willed. And as Clausewitz said, the great German military strategist, if you have a contest between one adversary who has great means and weak will and the other who has uh, great will but weak means, then the strong-willed one will win. And that's why Russia is winning. It's winning because it's willing to accept economic pain. It's willing to take risks. It's willing to lie about what it does, be really ruthless and canny in a way that we just aren't. So if we want to match Russia, we have to get our act together. And then we would not find this so much of a problem. That's it. Thank you very much, Edward. And now just a few comments from Magnus Nordenman. Sure. Um, and again, thank you so much for the organizers for, for having me. This is, this is a, a real opportunity for me. And also, it's an honor to stand here with, with Ed. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, and I've followed his work for a lot of years. So this is, uh, this is definitely a treat for me. Um, so I broadly agree with what, what Ed said. So maybe this will not be a super exciting conversation. Um, um, but I do want to add three points to what you already said, and then maybe expand on the specifically on the, on the transatlantic um, uh, transatlantic link. I, I certainly agree with Ed that that NATO is is back in business, and it certainly is is back in Washington in ways that you cannot have foreseen um, a couple of years ago. And again, in defense and deterrence is certainly high on that agenda. Um, I will warn that I do think we are facing a split alliance um, with the North and the East, obviously and understandably very very focused on the Russian challenge, uh, while those members to the south, uh, uh, Italy, Spain, France, Turkey, and others, are understandably very much focused on turbulence in the Middle East and turbulence in, in the Mediterranean and, and counterterrorism. And, and how do you make that balance come together? And, and, and how do you, how do you uh, gain consensus in an alliance that, that is actually facing um, two very different problem sets when, when it comes to security? Um, I also agree that hybrid is, is uh, hybrid warfare and, and, uh, and warfare under the threshold is, is certainly very important. My one fear, though, is that for some countries, it becomes an excuse to not do the hard stuff. Uh, when you talk about corruption, when you talk about um, organized crime, which, again, they're, they're all uh, uh, very important pressure points, but it can't be an excuse not to spend on defense and invest in, uh, in hard hard defense capabilities and instead uh, blame that you're working on anti-corruption and therefore it's, it's all okay in the end. Um, um, and then finally on the, on the Warsaw Summit, um, I do have high hopes um, uh, and, and as Ed said, I do think we're going to see the multinational battalions come out of the summit um, along with other commitments. But then it comes down to implementation uh, and the spending of resources and, and sticking with the plan. Um, and I do sometimes get a sense that folks around the alliance think that once we cross Warsaw, we can wash our hands of it, we've done our bit, and, and all the problems are solved. 
which is obviously not the case. Um, uh, Russia is a long-term problem. The turbulence around the Mediterranean is, is a, uh, a long-term problem. So at least I will watch uh, implementation uh, uh, very, very closely. And I think it's up to all of us to keep the uh, capital's feet to the fire um, when it comes to implementation of the, of the Warsaw Summit. Um, let me just make a couple of very brief comments about the transatlantic link and what, what this and what European security looks like um, from, a, uh, from a US perspective. Um, I will say that there are good news coming from Washington. I think the US is slowly but surely re-engaging in, uh, in European security, and, and especially here in this region. Um, Vault Ops uh, this year uh, just concluded. Uh, it's bigger than ever. Uh, there will be a US battalion in Poland coming out of the Warsaw Summit. Um, and obviously, there's also uh, deepening defense cooperation between the United States and, uh, and Sweden. Those are just a few examples, but they're, of course, especially relevant to to the Nordic Baltic region and the Baltic Sea region. Um, but I would also urge you to take a look at a lot of the strategy documents coming out of uh, Washington these days, everything from the US Navy uh, to the State Department and others, um, where Russia is now combined with China um, as being strategic challengers or strategic competitors to the United States. Uh, and that's different. Um, a few years back, it was all about China and what's happening in the Pacific, but, but Russia is now Russia is now part of that calculation, and, and indeed, the, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs and his testimony to Congress um, actually uh, placed Russia above China as a, as a strategic threat to the, um, uh, to the United States. And I think in Washington, there is a dawning realization that we are entering a period of, of global great power competition that is playing out in, in the Pacific, certainly, and around the South China Sea, but there's a European piece to this, and, and that is Russia that is seeking to seeking to alter the European security order that the United States played such a central, central role in, uh, um, uh, in building. Um, and this really fundamentally drives U.S. security engagement in Europe, and especially U.S. security engagement in the Baltic Sea region. Um, at the end of the day, this is not American charity work. Uh, this is about defending the European security order that the United States helped build, and the security commitments that the United States has, has made to, it, uh, to its allies. No one in Washington believes that Putin wants to rule the Baltic states. What we do tend to believe is that Putin wants to break the European security order. Uh, and the way to do that is to obviously demonstrate lack of commitment and, and lack, of, uh, lack of deterrence in the, um, uh, in the Baltic states. And obviously, uh, the mechanism for, for US engagement in Europe is through NATO. Uh, and that's why NATO is, is important to the United States and, and why the United States will, will work a lot of these issues through NATO. Um, along with all of its bilateral relationships. Um, just one final comment on the, uh, on the elections coming up uh, in the US. And again, I, I agree with, with Ed's analysis where, um, um, where we stand. Um, if we get a Clinton administration, I, I do think we will actually see an acceleration uh, of, um, of US engagement in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, with the Trump administration, all, um, all, bets, are, uh, all bets are off. Um, uh, and, and no one really knows uh, what will happen. I think that's actually why Brexit sort of scared the crap out of all of us because it shows the power of populism uh, and the unpredictability, uh, un unpredictability of populism. And, and there certainly is a populist movement um, uh, uh, in the US currently. Um, and it's interesting when you, when you listen to Donald Trump and what I think makes him different from, from all other presidential candidates from both the Republicans and Democrats is he actually never talks about American values. He talks about deals and he talks about making America strong and that America will win. Um, and whether it's a George Bush or a Hillary Clinton or an Obama or a Dole, pick your candidate. Um, at some point, they make a justification about um, or an explanation of what the US is about and what the US role is in the world and defending a liberal order and, and life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and, and all that good stuff. Trump actually never mentions it. It's all about being strong and winning. Um, um, so I think he's a deal maker. Uh, he's not about uh, defending a, a global system built on, built on liberal values. And I think he thinks he can make deals with a China and a Russia. And that certainly, I think, down the road has implications for a Ukraine and for an Estonia and for a Sweden and, and for a Poland um, and so forth. Um, final point, though, here is even if Trump loses, and I think at the end of the day, if, if, if I was going to bet a dollar, um, um, he, he, um, he will not uh, win the election. He has made a mark on the American public debate. Um, and the US will no longer kid around about European defense spending. Uh, there is a new tone and tenor to this. Um, the argument that NATO is obsolete and the argument that Europeans don't care about their own security 
um, used to be part of a small academic circle. Uh, now you hear it on CNN, you hear it on Fox News, you hear it in the big newspapers. And on the Hill. And, on the, uh, and absolutely on the Hill. Um, and when European delegations come to Hill making their case, the first thing the senators and congressmen do, they go and look up defense spending, and is it going up, is it going down? Um, um, so even though it's been a standing concern for the U.S. for a long time, obviously, Secretary Gates uh, left his position with a farewell speech to Europe uh, raising this issue. Um, but this issue will remain, and, and the U.S. is no longer, no longer kidding around, uh, and it will be up to, um, uh, to European countries when they come to Washington to show that they're doing more for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus, and thank you, Edward, for these interesting and excellent remarks. Um, I will just get at it right away. There's a giant pink elephant in the room, or a fat lady, as you <laughs> described it. Uh, we'll get back to NATO and the transatlantic link, but what about Brexit? Uh, what are the implications of Brexit for European security in the first place, but also for the transatlantic link? Well, I think there's three ways of looking at this. Um, the first is that it, it immensely diminishes Britain's <coughs> role as an international actor. Our reputation for responsible and well-informed decision-making has taken a big hit. Um, we are going to be poorer as a result, which means we have less money to do it. And we'll have to do security. We will have um, less attention. And a lot of our international relationships are going to be governed by... Um, our quest for economic survival. So if we're talking to, say, the Germans, maybe under a future Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel or um, Chancellor Steinmeier, who knows, these nightmares can happen. Um, instead, of, instead of saying to them, you've really got to get your ducks in a row as far as NATO is concerned, we'll be saying, sorry, please can we revisit the question of passporting for our financial services firms wanting to sell into the German market. So in a, all sorts of areas, we are going to be the demandeur. We're going to be asking for things. And a lot of those things we'll be asking countries who are not as strong on Atlanticism and on um, European security as we are. And I think security <coughs> will be sacrificed. So that's, that, that's bad. I think we also impose huge costs on our allies. I was mentioning earlier there's a lot of things that NATO can't do. And the EU can do them. The EU has been really good on energy security. It's stopped South Stream. It's demolished Gazprom's corrupt and coercive business model all over Europe. It's built north-south gas grids, better storage, better data, liberalised, unbundled, liberalised, and actually taking Gazprom to the, to the cleaners in the Competition Commission. And all that comes because of the Commission um, being strong and focused. And we've just given the whole basis of European decision-making a big kick, and that's going to come out in all sorts of other ways. So the EU is going to be weaker, and that means also on sanctions. I think it's going to be difficult to see how sanctions... Um, will be, it will, certainly particularly we have Chancellor Steinmeier, I don't think it's going to be so good to um, easy, easy to push sanctions through. Um, so that's it, direct costs and opportunity costs. All the efforts, all the damage we've done and also all, all the distraction we've created while we do, and I had a very good description of Brexit. It goes very short, it goes like this. I had a headache, so I shot myself in the foot. Now I can't walk and I've still got a headache. <laughs> This week, however, the, there's a tendency to look for positive side effects <coughs> of Brexit. Uh, and you were mentioning uh, the NBP Nordic Baltic Polish 9 earlier. Uh, do you think that Brexit might lead to larger or increased cooperation within the Nordic Baltic region? Well, I think that we are moving into an era of regional security. I think that the idea of that NATO at 28 as the big decision-making organization is basically over. It's kind of fiction. And actually, I mean, if you look at intelligence cooperation, there's a Putin on the phone for you. Um, in, in intelligence cooperation with Sweden is better than with some NATO countries because we can't trust them, and we do trust Sweden. But the UK is stressing now that it is still a committed NATO partner and it will yeah. commit a battalion but, and so forth. But I think the focus of that commitment is going to be increasingly towards this Nordic-Baltic theatre. And I'm, 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 I'm kind of worried about this because I think if we focus entirely on defending the Baltic states, 
that's framing the conflict in Russian terms. They're saying it's a bit like if you said, can we defend West Berlin during the Cold War? And the answer is we can't defend West Berlin. We can fight bravely. You know, we have soldiers there who will fight bravely and die for sort of two or three days. Meanwhile, all of NATO will attack the Soviet bloc everywhere, and that's a very good deterrent. And I want our deterrent to be very broad in geographical terms and very wide in terms of all things we can do, finance, cyber, information, all sorts of other things. So I worry about focusing the, our efforts on the military defence of, of, of the Nordic Baltic theatre, but I do think it's coming. That is where the action is in, in terms of what NATO can, can do and in terms of the military thinking and planning. All right, so I, I, want, I want to uh, pose a question to Magnus as well. Uh, you were mentioning the frustration in Washington over Europeans not spending enough money on defense. And actually, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what will it take for Europeans to start treating their defense seriously in terms of defense budget? You said that the US will no longer joke around. Will that help? It, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I actually don't. Um, I actually don't know. I mean, what's, what's interesting, what I think the Obama administration has tried to do is actually dial U.S. engagement back. Uh, in, in, so basically, in that, in that sense, forcing the, the allies and partners to, uh, to, to spend more. But now I, I think they're obviously looking to, to dial it back up again. I mean, look, the basic American argument is it's basically it's one of incentives. Um, as, as long as we're prepared to spend at the end of the day, um, the Europeans know that in, uh, incentive structure and therefore will not spend as long as they think that the Americans will come riding to the rescue at the, at the end of the day. So why do, what does it mean, this stop joking around like in concrete terms? Because I do, um, I, so that would be my next point. I, I do think at the end of the day, this, this uptick in American um, uh, interest cannot be sustained if we just go back to the old way of doing things. Um, so, so again, there's a, there's a clear case for it in Washington today, but as Ed pointed out, there, uh, there, uh, there's lots of other things that we could be spending our money on, including domestically on, on airports and roads and education and so on and so forth. So I do think there's, an, uh, there's a win of opportunity to invest now. But long term, the, um, um, this American engagement will not be able to be sustained without, without uh, European investments. Do you agree, Ed? Well, last time I was in Washington, I was heard uh, some congressional aides saying that their um, lawmakers, their senators and congressmen, were thinking that in future, in, in NATO, you will not be only candidates um, for, t for top jobs. Candidates must come from countries that are either are spending 2% on defence or have rising defence spending. And that would be a very tough one for some of the big countries that don't spend. I'm not sure whether that's sustainable, but I think even if America put that on the table, that would really wake people up. So it's about getting the fancy jobs. Well, if you, I mean, if you want to be taken seriously in NATO, you've got to be um, either have 2% or be moving towards 2%. And, and, uh, and I think America's quite good at putting, 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 put, putting, putting pressure on this. And, and it's, uh, I, think the, um, I think it's going to be quite unpleasant for countries that are, not, that are not playing along. Is it possible that we can see some sort of super group within NATO, the yeah. countries that spend 2% and more, sort of like a security council, but within NATO? Well, I think this is getting back to the coalition of the speedix. It's not just what you, what, what you spend, but what you spend your money on. And it doesn't, I mean, 1% uh, you know, one, one of, of, of German GDP is huge, but they spend it on a lot of the wrong things. 2% um, of Estonian GDP is tiny, but they spend it on the right things. So I think you, you're, you're going to see coalitions of the kind of the willing and speedy, um, which will be a sort of, you know, a sort of super NATO or mega NATO or core NATO or whatever, who are actually really interested in doing real defense. Um, you may get a similar sort of coalition in Southern Europe with people who are really interested in, you know, protect, protecting the external border of Schengen land and projecting European power beyond the Schengen land border. But I think we are moving rapidly away from these kind of simple, tidy, this is the EU, this is NATO, this is all sort of nice, easy stuff that you can do with a few lines on a bit of paper. We're moving into a much, much messier world. And the change is accelerating. You know, we are moving faster and faster towards this messy future. Can I, can I, add, can I add one nuance to this? Yes, uh, yes. Along these lines, I mean, along with Ed said, I think... Another way for, for, um, for Europeans to up their game is, is actually in, in various ways showing support for the broader U.S. global security agenda. I mean, a, a, after all, the U.S. is not European Santa Claus. It's, it's, a, it's a global superpower that has interest in Asia, that has interest in the Middle East. Um, and there are ways for even small European countries in, in various ways to work with the U.S. Uh, or, or show support for that. For example, Norway sends a frigate to the big Pacific uh, exercise that the U.S. does every year. 
doesn't mean that Norway plans to be a Pacific power, but it is an important political message from Oslo uh, that Norway understands and supports what the U.S. is trying to do in the Pacific. And the Arctic as well. Indeed. Mm. Uh, so if we keep to this messy future scenario that you're describing, uh, you mentioned that something ambiguous might happen, and this is a question for both of you. Uh, what exactly might this ambiguous thing be? Could you give some examples? And also, since we're on the island of Gotland right now, I know that Edward has been stressing the security policy importance of Gotland. Uh, could this be part of this messy scenario? Well, I think Swedes probably know this better than I do. Um, I think the, 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 the key thing is you have something which is looks like a kind of civil disturbance. Um, it could be a natural... Dis I mean, w you know, there's one series of scenarios which are about transit across Lithuania to Kaliningrad because Kaliningrad is dependent on transit links for road, rail, gas, electricity, telephone, everything. And not many people remember this, but back in 1994, there was a very mysterious incident where a, a, a railway bridge was blown up in Lithuania. Um, just as a Russian train was approaching. Just a couple of years ago, we had a Russian train that simply refu that stopped outside um, an important Lithuanian power plant and refused to move. So this is, this is quite difficult stuff. There's a lot of vulnerabilities there, and you could easily see a situation where Russia would say, Lithuanian nationalists are blockading Kaliningrad, and we have to intervene for humanitarian reasons because all the power has gone off in Kaliningrad. Do you think now, NATO would act upon this? Well, I mean, NATO is thinking about this really, really hard right now because we, you know, we have air policing, which polices Baltic airspace. Maybe we need to have a mission which is there, you know, fight, making absolutely sure we know what normal is in the transit across Lithuania. Because once we know what normal is, then we can say, well, that's abnormal. And we can then say to the Russians, it's abnormal and you're doing it, or this is abnormal, but it's genuinely a natural, this is a, a, you know, some, some kind of natural phenomenon. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is intervention in the um, so, so-called Russian-speaking areas of Estonia and, and Latvia. Again, where you could have a Estonian to, for human NATO is over by breakfast. What all these countries depend because we've lost it, and it was watching Putin opportunist. Um, so rather than sort of, you know, you will have pre-planned incidents and so on and so forth. Um, I think he looks for opportunities with Mongos. I think there's those um, Nord Stream too, and um, anything. And, and I mean, Ru Russia has always said that it regards even Nord Stream One as part of its sort of national critical infrastructure, and I think it's it's running a huge risk. I don't see why. You, this is something that weakens your allies. Um, allow, remember that Russian gas pipelines don't just export gas, they export corruption. Um, I, think there's, I, think, I think it would be really... I mean, I, I'm not sure that under international law you can stop it. International law doesn't have clauses for things like don't like or smells funny. But I think you should... Um, I, th I mean, if, if I was Swedish, I wouldn't want it. Magnus, you have anything to add to that? Just a very quick, s slightly different response to, to a slightly different question, but um, it's interesting. I mean, Gotland is once again being discussed in Washington, uh, this, this little island in, in, the, in the Baltic Sea. And I, I, I will say from a, from a U.S. perspective, um, Gotland is certainly important, um, but it is not the Iwo Jima of the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, at, le uh, at least not from a, uh, from a U.S. perspective. So there's... I'm not trying to explain it away, but to add, to add some nuance here, that, that again, it's, it's, uh, it, it, plays a, it plays an important political role, but I, I wouldn't call it sort of decisive or, or do or die mm. for, for regional security. Yeah, I mean, basically, with, with the stuff they have in Kaliningrad already creates such a headache. Right, right. It's not clear to me why they would want the extra headache of seizing Gotland to have a, a rather marginal advantage when it comes to their um, A to AD capability. We have a question from Shastin Lundge. And an anchor at the back. Yeah, anchor after. Well, uh, you mentioned my name, so uh, I just want to, to uh, ask, uh, because you talked about US perspective, UK and Russia, uh, but are there any political um, interests in EU countries to break up, to b uh, build their own defense uh, model? And uh, are they playing also poker in this. Any views on that? We'll ask uh, Anke to pose her question as well. Can we get the microphone to the back? Oui. And it's Anke Schmitz-Feldman from... Uh, Stick your hand up, Anke. Ui. Come 
Anke Schmidt-Weizmann, uh, Utrecht's Political Institute. Uh, I wanted to push you a little bit further on one of the other elephants in the room, which is, uh, in my mind, Germany. And uh, I would like you to, to reflect on what does it take for perhaps the other NATO and even EU member states to explain to countries such as Germany and to politicians in Berlin to understand what most of us here have understood, that perhaps the type of engagement that was pursued during the 1990s and up until January 2014 and beyond, that that perhaps will not create greater stability. So politically, what does it actually take to explain that the Baltic states and Poland are not just anti-Russian, Russophobic and provoking and just warmongering? How can you, if you have to talk to those politicians that seem to have a very hard time to understand the severity of the situation, how, how would you explain that to them? Thank you. We have two final questions, one regarding EU and tendencies to sort of build an alternate defense, and the second one regarding Germany and Germany's response to Russian aggression. I'll, I'll be very brief on, uh, on, on both of them. First on the, on the EU, uh, EU uh, issue, I think it's actually, the trajectory is actually pointing in a, um, in a different direction. I think we're actually seeing more um, EU-NATO cooperation, uh, and, and certainly again to, to meet some of the, the hybrid, hi, uh, hybrid <coughs> challenges. Um, but then I think one should also be clear, um, the Baltic states um, uh, entered NATO not because they were looking for protection from Portugal. Uh, they were looking for protection from the United States. Uh, and the United States is not a member of the EU, but, uh, but it is a member of, uh, member of, of NATO. But again, I, I think there's actually lots of synergies. And, and as you said, I think it's, um, I agree it'll be a messy world. And these organizations will, will have to play over, um, overlapping roles. And on, on, um, on Germany, I actually see uh, positive signs when it comes to defense spending, when it comes to engagement on, on hard security um, and, uh, uh, and defense in Europe. So I actually do think that, that overall, slowly but surely, Germany is actually moving in the right direction. I think with European defense, there's a lot of talk. It's a bit like people saying we need a European intelligence agency. And that's fine, but nobody actually wants to share their own national intelligence. So it ends up being sort of, you know, the sort of open source things. I think there's a, just in the w same way that Euroland, the Eurozone, is turning into a sort of country with a sort of economic governance, I think Schengenland is turning into a sort of country which needs to protect its frontier and project power beyond the frontier. And that's, that's continuing, and that will happen in cooperation with NATO. And that's good, and it's in un unprecedented levels. Um, and America wants Europe to have more de defense capability. And the idea that this is some kind of anti-American thing, I think, is is, is wrong. Um, so I'm, I think it, it, one could hypothetically imagine a sort of Franco-German superstate with enormous military capabilities that shrugged off American, um, the American alliance, but I, I can't see it, and it would need to be extremely expensive. And on Germany, um, I think we, we rely hugely on Merkel, and, and I always advise people, just remember what it was like under Schroeder. And it could easily, you know, that there's no built-in, I don't think there's a built-in Atlanticist majority in Germany right now. We are lucky to have Schroeder and von der Leyen, I think is a terrific defense minister, and the Verfassungsschutz is catching Russian spies, which is really good, and, you know, putting them on trial and deporting them. This is all, you know, really encouraging compared with a few years ago. Um, but there's still a very deep German belief that, um, as Helmut Schmidt said, we should always talk to Russia as a neighbor and never as an adversary. And Russia plays on that ruthlessly, and it penetrates German structures. They exploit the Russian population in Germany. They play on the, both the far left, Die Linke, and the far right. Um, you know, I think R Germany is a great test bed for all the different sort of soft things um, in this hybrid warfare, psychological warfare that, that, Russia, do that Germany does, uh, Russia does, and they are doing quite well at it. Thank you very much, Edward, and thank you very much, Magnus. We are out of time. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for coming here in the end of what must have been a very busy day for all of you. So a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.